turn, if you would, to Ruth chapter 4. Today we'll conclude our look at this neat little story. It's just a, a beautiful story. It's a true story, and it's there for a certain purpose. We'll look at that at the end. But there's definitely a picture of the gospel in the story of Ruth. One of the greatest fallacies of modern Christianity coming out of, uh, you know, a lot of the prosperity gospel, but it's come out of a lot of evangelical pulpits as well, is that if you're in God's will, everything will be easy. I think the disciples would argue with you on that, the original apostles. I think the apostle Paul would argue with you on that, shipwrecked, beaten, drug out of the city, eventually beheaded. But that's what a lot of the thought is in the modern church today, is that if you're in God's will, everything's going to be hunky-dory. Everything's going to be great and wonderful. Go back 11 years ago, 12 years, it's been 11. Uh, my previous church, uh, we were in the midst of one of the greatest recessions. Our neighborhood where the church was was one of the hardest hit in the state. Our real estate value was like a quarter of what it was in 2006. It was that bad. It was, it, we were one of the hardest hit in the states where our church was, and the church fell on hard times, and people were leaving left and right because they were leaving the community. They lost their homes. Their homes were foreclosed on. They lost jobs. All of those things were happening, and a couple came to tell me that they were going to leave the church, not because they were losing their home or losing their jobs or relocating or anything. They just didn't like to see things get hard. They didn't like to see things get tough, and the way they felt was that, well, if God is in it, you know, if God guides, God will provide. So the fact that the church was falling upon hard times must have been evidence to them that God wasn't providing and God wasn't in it. And they left the church, even though my pleas to the contrary. Unfortunately, that same couple took the exact same attitude towards their marriage a year later. Things got tough and they separated and ultimately divorced. Brothers Alex and Brett Harris wrote a book for young people about a decade ago to counter this notion. It was called, the title simply said, Do Hard Things. Get out of your comfort zone. A try hard things. Nobody ever achieved anything great by staying comfortable, by being complacent, by being still. The attitude that says that, that, that we've it's going to be easy, everything's going to be nice if we're in the Lord's will, has had a, a couple of effects on the church and on society. Much of the church has been made silent and still. Lori's grandma was a woman of wisdom, and uh, we had a family business, and family businesses, well, they're not fun. There could be bickering and fighting that goes home with you at the end of the day, and Lori's grandma would say, I don't see anything, I don't know anything, I don't hear anything. I don't say anything. That's how she stayed out of trouble. That's how she stayed out of trouble. Well, the church has taken the same approach. We don't stand for anything. We don't say anything. Okay, we've been made silent. We've been made still. We refuse to experience any discomfort or opposition or put forth any type of effort. We want the leadership of the church to keep providing new things to entertain us, to comfort us, to meet our senses. Another aspect of this is that this idea of miracle, the idea of a miracle has been cheapened. Many Christians have come to call minor victories miracles, things that would just happen if the church would do what Scripture tells us to do and has called us and commissioned us to do. If we would just do that, guess what would happen? According to Scripture, we would see lives changed. We would see people brought into a saving relationship with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if we would just face a little bit of discomfort and awkwardness and share that gospel of power. That's what would happen. But as it is, it happens so rarely that when we do see a life dramatically changed, we say, oh, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. No, it's just doing what God told us to do. When you see a miracle, the people that experienced them, one, they didn't see a miracle in everything. They usually experienced one miracle in their life, and it shook them to the core. It scared them to death. It, it, it amazed them. 
We've lost the sense of awe and wonder at the things that God can truly do. And, and God is sovereign in all of this. God is sovereign in all the activities of his bride, of his church. And when he saves somebody, God's sovereign in all of that, but it's not a miracle. He's done it for millions and millions of people. Billions, in fact. Countless Christians trying to stay comfortable, not wanting any awkwardness, not any discomfort, not wanting to offend anybody, have failed to experience the true power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They've ex- they failed to experience the true power of the Holy Spirit in-, in the Great Commission and in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in sharing the good news of what Christ has done. We're going to look at how this all plays out in the book of Ruth. Um, as we conclude today, uh, it's at the bottom of your sheet there, but our themes here, there's a main theme going on in the book of Ruth. There's a picture of the gospel. The main theme is devotion and redemption. Devotion and redemption. And it's not devotion of Boaz to Ruth, it's really Ruth's devotion to Naomi. There is some devotion all around, and then there's the redemption, the redemption of Boaz of Ruth through Naomi. But we see chapter 1 starts out with sorrow and sovereignty. Remember, they were in a pretty hopeless situation in chapter 1. There was no promise. There wasn't wasn't anything. There was no hope on the horizon. Yet in chapter 2, we see that right away. We see that there was hope. And then immediate provision. But this was basic provision. This wasn't huge blessing. This was a little bit of grain to go home and tide you over for a little bit. This is a bag of rice. And some beans or whatever. It wasn't great blessing. Chapter 3, we see a formal relationship start to develop. There was a proposal. But everything had to be on the up and up. It had to be above reproach. There had to be propriety in chapter 3. And then we get to our passage today. The main theme of chapter 4 is redemption and restoration. Redemption and restoration. So as we start off, In Ruth chapter 4, verse 1, we'll start off by looking at Boaz doing the right thing. Okay, he's doing the right thing. Where we left off last week in chapter 3, we saw that Ruth came by night, humbled herself, placed herself, submitted herself, put her at the feet of Boaz. Basically, she did the proposing the old Irish tradition on leap year that the women could propose to the men. You ever heard of that? Okay, kind of the same thing. She basically did the proposing. He was stunned by it, but he accepted, and he said that he would take care of it immediately. So he says in verse 18 uh, of chapter 3, he said, or then she said, uh, I'm sorry, this is Naomi speaking to Ruth. She said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. And that's exactly what we're going to read about here in chapter 4. So in chapter 4, verse 1, we see, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, Turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not... Tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. That was the closer relative's response. So the first thing we see is Boaz is taking care of business. He's keeping good on his promise. He says, I'm going to sort this out the very next day. We see him get up first thing in the morning. He goes to the city gates and does the right thing. So he brings forth. The, this closer kinsman redeemer, this one that is closer than him, and he tells them about the land and the purchase and Naomi's return and the opportunity to redeem Naomi and, and Elimelech's name, basically Elimelech's name. 
He did not tarry. We just looked at that. Naomi predicted that in verse 18. She said the man would not rest until he has settled it today. You'll have your answer. You'll have your answer by sundown the next day. Now, Boaz had a little bit of a plan. He would unveil the transaction one piece at a time, starting with the land, which was the least important to him. You can tell through the story and through the totality of the book of Ruth, he wasn't too much in it. He had lots of land. He had plenty of harvest. He had plenty of harvesters. He didn't need another couple acres. All right, he really wasn't interested in the land. He was interested in Ruth. Ruth was what he was after. So he starts out with that. He presents it to the kinsman redeemer. And uh, he just lays it out there. He's honest with them. Perhaps he thought that if he started with Ruth, well, that would be far too sweet of a deal to pass up. So he thought that he would start out with the land, which though it was necessary for survival, was hard to work and would require much upkeep and more workers to take care of it and all of those things. Perhaps he thought that by offering this labor-intensive land, he would dissuade the nearer kinsman redeemer. Nevertheless, Boaz wanted this to be done the right way, so he made sure everything was done in the presence of ten elders or ten witnesses, okay? So that he would uh, be above reproach and there would be no misunderstandings and there would be ten people to confirm what the arrangement and the agreement was. Boaz was also very clear that he was interested. If the closer kinsman redeemer was not interested in redeeming the land and redeeming uh, Elimelech's name, he was very much interested in redeeming Elimelech's name. And then the air was let out of Boaz's sails as the closer redeemer agreed to redeem it. You can think he's like, oh, didn't think he would go for that. He had plenty of land. Can you imagine the hit to the gut that Boaz must have been experiencing at that point? You ever been there? You have your hopes set so high on something, it appears that God is, is clearly moving in one direction, and then all of a sudden, bam, it just seems to all be over. It seems to all be over. What makes it worse for Boaz is that all of this was happening because he was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to be a man of integrity. This little thing called integrity, though it is by and far the best thing in the long run, it can oftentimes have negative repercussions in the short run. Think about listing every job, even the short tenured ones on a resume. That can lead to some interesting questions in an interview. Or being honest with a friend, okay, that's in a difficult situation that they've imposed upon themselves, saying, hey, you know, you kind of did this to yourself. A lot, a lot of times friends don't want to hear those kinds of things. But to be a person of integrity, you got to have those things. This is exactly where Boaz found himself. Apparently from verse 3, and then what we're going to see in verse 5, the closer redeemer was not even aware of Naomi's return and plight. She didn't even know Ruth existed. Boaz hadn't said that yet. He told her there in verse 3, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. It's not until verse 5 he unveils Ruth. We don't know why this was. How come this closer kinsman didn't know of Naomi's return? We don't really know. Perhaps his homestead was further out from the city. He just went to town. He had to go to Walmart once a week or so and didn't know. Hadn't heard the news. You know, perhaps these relatives were maybe temporarily estranged. Sometimes that happens. Maybe they weren't even arguing or fighting about anything. They just got busy with their own lives and didn't talk, didn't see each other. But it would seem that there was ample opportunity for Boaz to get what he wants and play dumb later. He could have totally taken advantage of the situation and played dumb later, but his integrity kept him from doing so. Boaz was the kind of man who could sleep well at night, at least as far as his conscience was concerned. He knew he didn't cheat anybody or do anything wrong. Boaz was learning or at least experiencing what he may have already known at this point, and this is your first point, and that's that integrity isn't always painless. Integrity isn't always painless, but it's still the way to go. 
Integrity isn't always painless, but it's still the way to go. Returning the lost wallet with all the money still intact. Telling the truth even if it gets you in trouble. Speaking up uh, against popular opinion. That's going to become a bigger and bigger and bigger problem for you and I in the society we are living in now. Our society believes this truth somewhat. Integrity isn't always painless, but it's still the way to go. You know, you look at our political situation, and I can't think of hardly anybody in Washington that would fulfill that word integrity. We kind of believe it, and yet our rulers, our leaders, our representatives are anything but oftentimes. We believe at least the first part, that integrity isn't painless. There's this oft-repeated notion that good guys never win. It seems that way sometimes. And in many ways, this adage rings true. We've probably all experienced the, the co-worker who spent more time schmoozing the boss than actually working, and then they take all sorts of shortcuts in their work, and then they get recognized for it by the boss they've been schmoozing. Boy, that's a hit in the gut. I've experienced that one a couple times. You know, the answer can be found in Jeremiah. We see it in Psalm 37. We see it in Job 21. It's one of the greatest questions. We've looked at this a couple of times in the last year. We asked that question, why do the wicked prosper? Well, in Jeremiah, he's lamenting this to the Lord. He says in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, Righteous are you, O Lord, that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. But why? Why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all these who deal in treachery at ease? You have planted them. They have also taken root. They grow. They have even produced fruit. You are near to their lips, but far from their mind. But you know me, O Lord. You see me, and you examine my heart's attitude towards you. This is real seeker sensitive here, but drag them off like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for a day of carnage. And thus the Lord will. It will happen. Boaz could have dealt treacherously with the closer kinsmen, but eventually he would have to answer to God. Okay, He, he could have taken Ruth as his own without bringing the matter before the closer uh, kinsmen. He could have been guilty before God of coveting and adultery by taking what was not rightfully his yet at that point he would have had to answer to god at that point but god's not done blowing into boaz's sails yet we're going to get keep going the closer kinsman redeemer agrees to take the land and then in verse five we see that there's more you ever watch those tv commercials and they tell you the great deal the sham wow or whatever it is i haven't had tv in a long time but i can still hear those annoying commercials trying to sell you some subpar product as though it's a miracle. Welcome to modern-day evangelicalism. But anyways, but wait, there's more. They always say at the end of those commercials. Verse 5, Then Boaz said to him, On the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. On his inheritance. Most likely devastated by the closer redeemer's desire to redeem the property, Boaz decides to do the honorable thing and reveal what was for him the icing on the cake. That was Ruth. Ruth was the icing on the cake. This lovely, young, industrious woman of excellence from Moab. He'd have to marry her for the sake of the dead to carry on their name on their inherited property, their family property. But even if it wasn't for the sake of the dead, she was quite a catch herself. So how could anybody possibly refuse is what Boaz is thinking to himself. And then the unbelievable happens. Take a look at verse 6. In verse 6, the closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. 
redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land. To confirm any matter, a man would remove his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. Unbelievably to Boaz, the best part of the deal The only part of the deal that was really of any interest to him was, in fact, the deal breaker for the closer kinsman redeemer. He didn't care about the land. He only wanted Ruth. And he thought the closer kinsman redeemer would be the same way. But the closer kinsman redeemer said, hey, I'll I'll take the land. But when he found out about Ruth, he goes, whoop, whoop, stop, deal breaker. That'll jeopardize my inheritance. Boaz was probably elated at this point. We're not told of the details of how this would jeopardize his inheritance. In fact, we're not even sure if the inheritance he was to receive, uh, if this was an inheritance he was to receive or an inheritance he was to leave to his own children. All we know is that his estate planner, his financial advisor, was over in the corner shaking his hand saying, no deal, that's not a good one, don't do it. There's lots of speculation in the commentaries as to how this jeopardized his own inheritance, but we really don't know what that was. The closer kinsman passed on his right of redemption, and now Boaz could legally, with integrity and uprightness and, and, and innocence before the Lord, he could redeem Ruth and redeem Elimelech's land. The author gives us, and apparently as contemporary here, is a history lesson in one of the customs of ancient Israel there. They would take their sandal off. We saw earlier, if you refused to redeem it, they could take the sandal off and smack you across the face, right? Spit in your face. Same thing is going on here, but they would exchange a a sandal. I guess that was such an intentional act that you understood what the deal was. Everybody's in terms of agreement. If I actually stoop down and hand you my dirty, stinky shoe, we, we must be in good understanding of what's going on. It's a very intentional act. We don't really know what this removing the sandal is all about, but to be honest, uh, it's just what they did. Like, we shake on it, okay? We shake on it when making a deal, or if we're leery of just a handshake, we want to sign on it. We want to see a contract. Well, in this day, the sandal was offered. It's a very deliberate, it's a clear act. If I take my shoe off and I hand it to you, you know we got a deal. We got an understanding. We're in agreement on the terms, And the terms of the deal have been agreed upon and accepted. They didn't have a contract, but they had ten witnesses who could give an account of what they understood the terms to be should any dispute arise. Depending on your translation, Boaz either quickly removed his sandal or received the other man's sandal. Some of the translations interpret that and translate that a little bit differently. When he thought it was over, though, When his hopes were quickly dashed, he thought, oh, man, the wind was taken out of his sails. He took that shot in the stomach. All of a sudden, just as instantly, they were all quickly restored. They were quickly restored. Now, I could point at this. In fact, many would. They'd point at this point and tell you, see how God wants you to prosper and give you all the objects of your desire? See how he loves you and wants everything to work out for you? That's what a lot of pastors would say at this point, but we know that's not the truth. Sometimes you don't always get the girl. Sometimes the mortgage isn't always approved. You don't always get that promotion. Sometimes the loved one does not come home from the hospital. This is a reality of life. You guys are thinking, man, pastor, you're a downer today. Well, hold on. Give me a break. So what is the lesson here if it isn't that God always makes every situation work out for the good of the good guy, okay? To answer this question, we have to look at why we have the book of Ruth in the first place. The book of Ruth would have never been written, and this love story of Ruth and Boaz uh, would have never been known. It would have just gone into anonymity with so much unknown history, okay? Okay? If it wasn't for the fact that their great-grandson was King David. 
That's their great-grandson. King David would not be so prominent uh, were it not that Jesus, the Messiah, would come through his line. He's listed there in Matthew 1 in the genealogy of Christ. Okay? We wouldn't know who King David is. If you don't believe me, tell me without looking at a chart in your study Bible who the fourth king of Judah is after the divided kingdom. If you know that right now, you're preaching next week. Okay. We know who King David is because of Christ. Somebody said they know? Who's looking? Somebody's flipping. I'll tell you, it's Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Okay? You see, the point here, here's the lesson that I want you to take from this story is that, and this is your next point, God exercises his sovereignty through seemingly normal, uncertain lives. God exercises his sovereignty through seemingly normal, uncertain lives. We think of everybody in Scripture as being somehow ultra-blessed or super-chosen, and they knew it. When Ruth and Naomi started walking back from Moab, you know, famished, half-starved to death, uncertain of what they were going through, they didn't feel blessed. Both widowed, both hungry, both facing an uncertain future. They didn't know what God was doing, but God knew what he was doing. We find ourselves in that situation. We might find ourselves in a bleak situation, and we cannot make head nor tails of it. God, how is this going to work out for your glory? How is this a blessing to me? How is this going to work out? We might not know, but God knows. So the book of Ruth would have never been written if it were not for King David, and we wouldn't know of King David if it were not for Jesus. We know of Jesus because he was God's plan to redeem, like a kinsman, like a kinsman redeemer, people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and every people, and to fulfill a promise on the extreme opposite end of the history of mankind. Jesus in the end is redeeming men. Here we are. Here's the end times. Maybe we're there. And here he's redeeming men and women and children from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people with what? His blood. Okay, Revelation chapter 5. Why is he doing that? To fulfill a promise all the way at the other end of time to Abraham. I will make your seed a blessing to all the nations, to all the people. God knows what he's doing. God is sovereign over all of history. He knows exactly how he would use Abraham and, and that one promised child, that seed, to bless all of the nations. In the middle, there's been lots of people saved from many transgressions through the act of that one chosen child. When we're walking with righteousness, we're walking in integrity like Boaz and Ruth. God's more apt to bless us, but sometimes we are not. Whether then the answer is yes or whether the answer is no, we can know that God is sovereignly orchestrating his will for those who love him and for their ultimate good, which far surpasses every little good thing they desire in this life alone. Oftentimes, we want a yes from God for something so short-term, it's insignificant in the grand scheme of things. And he's willing to disappoint us and say no to this short-term, insignificant thing to bless us in the longer run, in the grand scheme of things. And the greatest thing we have is that redemption through Jesus Christ and a restored relationship with God that we can someday dwell in eternity in heaven with him with no separation. He will uh, be our tabernacle. He will dwell among us as our God and we will be his people and there will be no separation. That's the ultimate blessing. Everything else pales in comparison. Everything else pales in comparison. Every, if you are there, if you genuinely are of God's uh, children, if you are a child of God and you stand and behold the fullness of his glory without any separation in heaven someday, you will not remember one blessed little thing to be disappointed about in this life. You won't think of one disappointment. You will be struck with awe and amazement. 
So here we go. Redemption is here. Let's go back to Ruth chapter 4, verse 9. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are my witnesses. Today I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court or of his place of birth. You are my witnesses today. And all the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. She gave birth to that son. Righteousness and integrity is rarely only about us. There are people that will really strive hard in the flesh to walk with righteousness and integrity, if only for their own reputation, if only for their own ego and to build them up. But true righteousness and true integrity is rarely about us. It's about honoring God and it's about honoring somebody else, our family, their reputation. The most forgotten beneficiaries of this story, though posthumously, is Elimelech and Kilion and Malion. Their names, Malon, their names would continue. They weren't forgotten and dead in Moab. Okay, their name was brought back to Bethlehem, their home, where they are still being remembered. You know, let's go back, what, three, 4,000 years? We're going 3,000 years back if they're four generations before David. David was 3,000 years ago. Figure a couple generations before that. Here their name is, on the other side of the world, being remembered in Bethlehem about their inheritance. Their land would not go to strangers. They would still have representation at the court of the town of their birth. This wasn't lost on Boaz either. He knew this. He knew this is why he was acting so uprightly. He understood it, and he brought that up. He's the one that brought that up. Also on the subject of sovereignty, the people of the court reflect on all the daughters of Israel, the daughters of Laban, the wives of Jacob, the sisters Rachel and Leah, through whom came all of Israel along with their their maids, okay? They thought specifically of their being descendants of Judah through Tamar, and even in God's sovereignty through that inappropriate relationship, God was still at work. And they were still his people. God was sovereignly acting in the lives of Boaz and Ruth for many generations before they even existed. And the same is true for us. God was orchestrating all of this before they were even born. Remember who Boaz's mother is. Rahab. Rahab, the harlot. Yet God was orchestrating all of this for many generations before they even existed. And the same is true for us. Many people think that God's sovereignty in our lives, it might go back as far as our parents. Well, I'm sure glad my parents met. They met in Bright Angel Hall in 1960 at Grand Canyon College in the lobby. It was supposed to be a blind date, and the person that was supposed to introduce them didn't show up, so they had to awkwardly introduce themselves to each other. Some people might go back as far as their grandparents or their first generation of their family that came to the new land as immigrants. But here's the truth, and this is the truth for all of humanity, and this is your point. God has been acting in his sovereignty on your behalf for many, many generations. I would say, in fact, all of them, all of them, all the way back to Adam and Eve. 
the first parents. God has been acting in his sovereignty. For your behalf. We have this idea that somehow we had to be born and get out of our parents' house and somehow develop our own character and nature, and God's got to get to know us. God's got to see how we're going to be before he decides what he's going to do with us. It's not what Scripture says. He knows what we are. We're all sinners, fall short of the glory of God. If there's anything reputable or decent about us, it's because he's given it to us. Ephesians chapter 4, or chapter 1, verse 4, he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundations of the world. He chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Verse 13 says that the Lord enabled Ruth to conceive. We think we know how conception takes place. We're like, do they really need it? Okay, but it says the Lord enabled her. The Lord enabled her to conceive. But it isn't just that he just decided to do it. He says, oh, this is such a cute love story. This is neat. It's, it's so neat how Ruth and, was devoted to Naomi. And, and boy, that was so nice of her to be so devoted to her mother-in-law. And they went back to this land in desperation. And Boaz took pity on them. What a neat story. I'm going to add a baby to boot. That's not how God's sovereignty worked. The whole story belonged to him. The whole story was written by him. He had decided in the centuries past, even though Boaz had no idea what that nearer kinsman would say, God knew exactly what he was going to do. And he knew exactly how he was going to do it. And look at the end of the story. Isn't this just Ruth's story? Let's look at verse 14 through 17. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. The father of David. You get caught up in everything in chapter 3, and in the end of chapter 4, we kind of forget about Naomi, the mother-in-law. You would think the story is only about Ruth and her temporal happiness and married, wedded bliss and all of these things, but... Ultimately, this is about redeeming Naomi, the mother-in-law. If the story has Ruth and Boaz as the first layer of significance, certainly Naomi is the second layer of significance with David as the third, and, and though ultimately Jesus is the fourth layer of significance here in this story, and we, as Christ redeemed, are the fifth layer. This led to our salvation, this story, this orchestration of God. Ultimately, it's about Christ. It's about Christ, our kinsman redeemer, our kinsman redeemer. This story is particularly about Naomi as well. Go back to chapter 1 and remember verse 13. Okay? She said, would you therefore remain from marrying in chapter 1, verse 13? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Verse 20, when they return, she told the women of Bethlehem, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And in verse 21, she goes, I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has been witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. We come back to chapter 4 and here she is full again. Full again. Restored and redeemed. She has joy again. She has hope again. She has family again. She is 
lost two sons, but as the people see it, Ruth is worth more to her than seven sons. If anybody's here been the mother of seven rowdy boys, you'd probably agree. Two boys, for that matter. But that's how virtuous Ruth was and is. And to make it all the better, Naomi's now a grandma, a.k.a. unpaid babysitter. She's got that joy of that little one bouncing on her legs, bouncing on her knees. And all things seem to be restored. And all of this is a story of redemption and restoration. We have honestly, we, we have no concept or idea of how far we have fallen. We really don't know. So when we have temporary little insignificant setbacks and disappointments, we get all down in the dumps, but we have no idea how far we have fallen from, from the Garden of Eden, from the glory of God and walking in his presence. And one day when we're restored to the fullness of that glory, we're going to forget all that minor stuff. It's going to all go away. We won't remember that and the little disappointments of this life. We'll say, hmm. God must have something better. God must have something different. So here we see your last point is that God through the gospel is a restorer of souls. God through the gospel of Jesus Christ is a restorer of souls. And then just to wrap it up, not leave it any loose ends, verse 18 through 22 now, these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram, Amenadab, and to Amenadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon, Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz, Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse, David, the king. David, the king. And of course, from the line of David and the throne of David, Christ rules forevermore, complete and total in the restoration and the redemption of mankind. That we would be children of God, we'd be co-heirs with Christ. It's pretty amazing and phenomenal to think about. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do love you and we praise you, Lord God. We thank you. We thank you that you are working all things for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose, Lord God. And Lord God, we know that we are living for such greater and grander things than any temporal blessings. Lord God, we know that our faith cannot be based on perceived temporal blessings and perceived setbacks and disappointment, Lord God. Let our faith be more solid. Let us trust in you. Let our faith not waver even when the answer is no. Let our faith be strong, Lord God, even when we in our flesh are disappointed, Lord God. Let us know that ultimately the great blessings are yet to come. Lord God, we thank you for the promise of eternal life and a restoration to a relationship with you in your fullness of your glory, Lord God, through the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus came and gave us the clearest picture of who you are through his sinless, spotless, blameless life, his righteousness credited to us so undeserving. And our punishment that we do deserve falling upon him upon the cross. Lord God, we thank you for your great satisfaction through that glorious resurrection. And we thank you for the gift of faith and the power over sin, the power of repentance, Lord God, through the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. Lord God, it is our prayer, Lord God, that this gospel message would not just ring hollow in the walls of this building, Lord God, but it would penetrate our hearts. It would penetrate the hearts of those who already believe and encourage them and strengthen them and bolster them. Lord God, that it would bring those who are completely dead and hopeless in their transgressions, Lord God, we would pray that it would bring unto them life. 
Lord God, we would pray that this gospel message would extend beyond the walls and the property and the perimeter of this church, Lord God, out into the community, and that we can engage them with this glorious gospel of hope. Lord God, we thank you for taking us from a hopeless, dead, sorrowful situation and in your goodness restoring us to have all of the blessed hope and have life and to have it abundantly, if not here, better yet with you in heaven. We love you and we praise you. We ask all of this in your precious and your holy name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and sing praises.